Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gautam Das. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Engineering, and I'm the host today. As I have been for the last few uh, semesters, couple of semesters, uh, for the College of Engineering virtual brown bag series on Fridays. Uh, today's uh, presentation is going to be on a topic of great interest uh, to a lot of people. On It's going to be on traumatic brain injury risk predictions. Our presenters are uh, Professor Asfak Adnan. He is a professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering department here at UTA. And uh, we also have a guest uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Kathleen Kelpin. She is the director of National Engagement Parallax Advanced Research, Dayton, Ohio. And she and Dr. Adnan have worked together a few times. Uh, she is also a commanding officer uh, in the Navy region, Japan. So we are very excited to have her as a guest speaker today. Um, so I think uh, rather than me reading out the abstract, I will let uh, the speakers uh, give details about uh, the presentation as they as they delve deeper into the talk. At this point, I will welcome them uh, to start. Just a note to the audience that, um, uh, you know, if you have any questions, and I'm sure you will have a few, please uh, note them down in the chat question answer box that you have. And once the presentation is over, I will uh, make sure that they are read out to our presenters who will try to answer them. Looking forward to a great one hour. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Das, uh, for the introduction. I think also for inviting us uh, for this, I think, very interesting opportunity. And, and thank you, Dr. Gilpin, for joining. I think uh, uh, it will be uh, very interesting. I, I look forward to this you know, presentation for the next one hour. So uh, I think a bit, you know, uh, introduction about how uh, I start collaborating with Dr. Gilpin would be meaningful. So uh, I think the last five, you know, five years, uh, uh, several times, I went to the Naval Research Lab uh, as a summer faculty fellow. I think uh, in one of the years I, I met Dr. Gilpin. At that time, she was a postdoc at the Naval Research Lab. And we uh, uh, worked in the same building and, you know, uh, time to time we talked and, and understood that we had common interest and then eventually we, we keep talking and ended up here today. We, we ended up writing two papers and I think still continue uh, different things uh, because our expertise is very complementary. As, as you know, she is a neuroscientist by training and, and, and I'm an engineer, work on the similar topic. I think that help us understand uh, different uh, you know, subject matters and then uh, do something meaningful. So what, uh, as you can see from the title, what we're trying to do is understand brain injury, maybe in a more detailed level uh, uh, from the brain tissue, and try to uh, predict uh, the brain injury risk uh, from uh, the, the material perspective. Okay? And, and what it means is, uh, this small cartoon will, will show you that when head is, is subjected to trauma, and trauma, by trauma I mean uh, not emotional trauma, I, I mean a physical trauma, it could be in the form of force, motion I'm going to talk more detail later and then depending on the magnitude and intensity of this force and motion injury can happen and and that means uh, any motion is subjected to an head means that is the probability of injury right and uh, as a material scientist we when we have a material we know that that in order to see at what level of force or motion can cause this material to damage what we do is we put the material in a, in a test frame, we pull them and see when it breaks. Uh, this is not an option for head, right? This is a living matter. So what we want to do is, without subjecting the head in harm's way, we want to analyze the brain tissue in a very deep level and try to predict what level of force or the motion will lead to injury to this brain so that we can develop protective equipment and, and other man, you know, matters so that the brain is not really experiencing that kind of force at all. So that's the whole idea. So, of course, I don't think it is uh, not really uh, uh, needless to say that TBI is a serious health hazard 
and I think it is it is uh, common in many uh, fields. Sports is one of them because it involves contact, and uh, all sorts of sports like football, hockey, uh, you know, baseball, basketball. If you think about, can cause TBI. Accident is another one. Uh, if, if someone is in a collision or bump their head, essentially uh, TBI can occur. And another area TBI can occur is in the battlefield, right? Our, our, our war fighters, soldiers, uh, they may ex expose to blast or similar uh, kind of you know, scenario, and that can cause this head uh, to experience TBI, right? So uh, TBI, you can see that it's no wonder, like every one in a third injury related death is actually because of the TBI, right? And in, in US itself, uh, you know, I think more than 50,000 per year uh, is death coming from the TBI. And uh, you, can, you can see that uh, over 1.5 million uh, injury is because of the TBI. Yes, that's definitely right. Uh, traumatic brain injury really affects all of society. And so if you are individually affected, there are some uh, potential long term health implications that that could come into play down the road. Um, and these could be a physical disability, um, of course, maybe some lost wages or the inability to keep a job at all uh, pending pending those physical outcomes. Um, so it really can be quite devastating to the individuals affected, but also to all of society because um, it could be upwards of $60 billion cost to the US economy. So um, it really is um, an injury that, that we need to uh, prioritize uh, researching. And so on the next slide, I'm gonna show you uh, how it is particularly um, of importance to the military as well. So 85.7% of all TBIs diagnosed in the military are mild traumatic brain injury. And on the one hand, that's quite good, right? Because it's, it's better to have a mild traumatic brain injury than a penetrating traumatic brain injury, let's say. Um, so that's, that's quite good. On the other hand, though, that can be even more challenging because it's really difficult to see symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury, and it's difficult to diagnose mild traumatic brain injury. So it's, um, you, you know, you can see both positives and negatives to, to having mild traumatic brain injury be the most common cause of traumatic brain injury, or the most common form of traumatic brain injury. And then on the bottom of the slide, um, it's, it's broken out by service. And you can see that the Army is uh, disproportionately more affected by a traumatic brain injury than the other services. Um, but really, the takeaway message is that traumatic brain injury is important for all of society, um, and then most especially for the, the folks in the military. And so uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Adnan, who's going to talk about how traumatic brain injury can affect the head and the, and the brain and um, start us into a biological discussion on that. Uh, thank you, Kate. So uh, this, you know, I, I think cartoon shows the various ways that TBI can occur, right? I think we can broadly classify them into these three categories. One is so-called the penetrating injury. That means if I if I bring this uh, football as an example, if if something goes through the skull and get in, we can think about if a penetration happens to the head, and of course, uh, you know, it could be very lethal, right? And and that is one category. And the second two categories are, are uh, really associated with force and motion. And, and I want to define what it means by contact injury. You think about uh, a head and suddenly a contact force is applied to the head. So this is a force applied to the head that gives you a, a TBI due to contact, right? And another way, uh, the acceleration and deceleration, it means uh, you are subjecting the head into motion. And there are two ways it can happen. Think about someone is walking and suddenly, you know, bump their head, a, a, a moving head suddenly coming to a stop. So this is a deceleration. And other example would be if you think about someone is standing or stationary and maybe exposed to blast wave, and that will lead to sudden, uh, you know, acceleration of the head that it, it will just, you know, kick out, right? So, uh, uh, so the category B is is the force that is subjected to the head. And then category C is, is the motion. It could be either stoppage or sudden acceleration. And all of these can cause TBI, depending on the extent and the speed and the, of this motion or the force, right? 
So this small pattern will show you that when head is, is subjected to this kind of motion, sudden stoppage, you can feel that because of the inertia force uh, associated with it, it actually goes through a back and forth motion, right? And the back and forth motion could be slow like this, or it could be very rapid. And because of this, what you can see that our head actually, is, uh, the brain tissue actually is floating inside the skull, right? And when this back and forth motion happens, the front end and the back end of this brain tissue continuously, repeatedly subjected to an expansion and compressive force, right? And when force is applied to a material, you can think about when it is very, you know, very high, it can lead to, you know, damage to the tissue. So that is kind of underlying a physical mechanism that can lead to a brain injury, depending on the extent of this motion and the force, right? So we want to look at the brain tissue in a, in a very deep level at, at a very high magnification to see how the tissue really is constructed uh, to understand, in particular, if you want to go for predicting brain injury due to material damage, right? So, of course, we all know that a brain tissue that you can see that that looks something like this. And if we can slice it, then this is the slice of this brain tissue look like. And we, we all know uh, we can broadly classify this brain tissue in, in terms of the gray matter and the white matter. Right. And and the, the, uh, the gray matter, it is a little darker in, in, in appearance and the white matter is little uh, exist deep down in the brain tissue and little you know lighter in appearance. And if we go one scale down, that means if I magnify this tissue, uh, you know, selectively, one taken from the uh, gray matter and another one taken from the white matter, this is what we are going to see. We're going to see that the gray matter actually is composed of billions of highly parallel neural cells packed together and they call it the cortical column, right? And this is a columnar structure. And if you look at the white matter, and if you magnify it, you will see that the white matter actually is composed of, you know, a fatty fiber tracts. OK, and there are the fat layers exist that gives us the uh, uh, kind of lighter appearance. Now, if we go even one scale down, that means we magnify it even further, then you will be able to see that the fiber tract actually has this so-called uh, outer shell. We call it myelin seat, and that is the kind of packing of this in individual fiber in the fiber tract. On the other hand, if we look at the neuron cell that, that appears in the cortical column, that means in the gray matter, this is how they will look like, right? So this is kind of highly magnified view of the neuron cell. And if you want to know that we have over 150 billion neuron cells in a, in a normal uh, brain tissue. So they actually are the major component of the uh, brain tissue, right? And obviously, uh, 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 we can think about if the brain damage happens or the injury to the brain happens, they are the one who will actually uh, lead to further injury, right? So they will be the affected first. So we need to look at the neuron cell very closely and see what caused the damage and as such, right? So this is the single neuron cell uh, taken, uh, looked at under the microscope. You can see that uh, these uh, uh, outer shell, these are the myelin seat, and the interior structure has a lot of components. We call it cytoskeleton elements. These are fiber, uh, you know, fiber-like uh, entities. So we can look at the entire brain structure from different length scales, right? And if you think about that at the very broad scale, that means we can we can see the head in, with our open eyes. That we call it the head scale, and if we further magnify the brain tissue and look all the way down to the uh, highly magnified scale, which is at the level of nanoscale, we can actually start to see the cortical column, the fiber tract, and then the you know, single neuron cells and that they are surrounding extracellular matrices. And then you can go further with the single neuron cell, we can break down to their individual parts like the cytoskeleton elements, the, the microtubule, the tau protein and as such. So if we want to predict brain injury, okay, or, and what are the risks of the brain injury, we need to do this. For a given amount of applied force or motion, 
we need to translate this force and motion into the force and motion that brain tissue experiences at all levels because you can see that our brain tissue highly complicated and heterogeneous structure so we need to look down every aspect of the brain tissue and, and try to understand how the, the applied force and motion affects those individual regions at different length scales. So what we do is we look at the brain injury at the very, very small length scale. We call it the cellular scale and try to look at the cause and effect of the brain injury at that scale and try to kind of build up our overall injury prediction model uh, as a bottom up. So that's kind of our, our, our approach, right? In order to show that what others are doing, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, ways to predict, you know, head injury in, in a so-called head injury criteria that takes into account a, a critical motion of the head and find out what motion will lead to head injury. And there are ways to predict the brain injury from the tissue perspective. Then we look at what internal pressure or internal stretch will lead to injury like this, right? And, and so does for the cellular level. So if you want to break down uh, the, the brain injury criteria, what are the key players that can really help us understand the brain injury? I think we can simplify this into these four parameters and I'm going to tell you uh, uh, immediately what it means. So as I said you, there are three ways the brain injury could be assessed uh, from the macroscopic scale, we call it head injury. We, we look at the head motion and then or the tissue injury, we, we look at the internal stress or deformation and how fast or slow the brain is moving and try to predict injury. And at the cellular level, we try to look at, again, the internal deformation of the, of the neuron cells and also at what speed they're moving, right? Collectively, uh, the, the, the motion in terms of acceleration or deceleration, the internal stresses in terms of force and the deformation and the rate means how fast and, and, and slow this, this uh, if traumatic force is being felt. OK, so these are the four things can define the extent of you know, injury uh, or due to due to some exposure to traumatic force. Right now for measuring force, those who know how to deal with force, you need actually a, a transjection, right? You need to measure this force internally and then translate into a, a, a kind of readable entity. That means if you want to measure force inside brain, we need to probe something inside the brain, which is not a practically possible solution. So what we want to do is we want to uh, uh, define injury in terms of entities that is not very invasive. Think about the brain tissue. We can we can look at actually subject this brain tissue under a microscope. We can, we can image them with a very high resolution. And, and track down the deformation or motion of this brain tissue without really doing any harm to the brain. So we want to utilize these capabilities of, 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 of imaging and track down that you know, deformation instead of working on the force, right? At the same way, we can take real-time images and then we can track down how fast and slow the brain tissue is moving. So our goal is to look at the brain injury at the cellular level at the same time try to quantify injury or the predict injury in terms of something we can measure using imaging capabilities, which is deformation and the rate. So this is what we are going to show you that at the cellular level, what we have done so far and what are the many things we have to do in the coming days. But this is in a way our kind of overarching goal that we want to produce a so-called brain injury curve, it's starting from the cellular level, and that curve will have two parameters that will define the risk. One is the amount of deformation, which is in, in, in technical term, we call it strain, okay? And another one is the rate of deformation, how fast or how slow we are subjecting the brain into this kind of deformation. If we can track down these two key parameters and then plot them in this chart, we will be able to tell that what combination of a strain and the strain rate would lead to injury at the cellular level. As you can see that this is an initial outline of this cellular data based on the evidence we have in the literature, based on the way a neuron cell behaves and, 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 and all the different pathways involved, right? So 
if we are in this so-called the green zone, that means like any combination, any combination of strain and strain rate, if that puts this data over here, that means that combination of strain and strain rate will not be uh, injurious to the neuron cell. But it can happen that we have the same amount of strain, but we are applying this at very high speed that will bring this data point over here. And that would mean the brain injury will, 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 will commence in a way so-called pathway injury, uh, pathway induced injury. Pathway, what we mean is a mechanical injury doesn't happen. That means brain a neuron cell didn't really break apart due to this force or the rate. However, the chemical signatures coming in and over a long time, a, a different pathway is, is, is followed and eventually lead to an injury to the brain, right? And I think Dr. Gilpin is going to talk a little more about this. And of course, the mechanical injury, what it means that the extent of this strain and the strain rate combination is so severe that it caused the neuron cell death immediately. And what we want to achieve is populate the, this uh, injury curve as many uh, ways possible so that we have a very comprehensive understanding that what combination of strain and the strain rate would lead to injury or not. If we have that, then we can to, you know, take this data to the next level and find a way to protect our head from experiencing that kind of injury. That's kind of the goal. So in order to do that at the cellular level, what we have to do is we have to look at every possibilities of the ways the neuron cell or and its surrounding can really uh, be injured, right? So what we do is we take into account the possible ways the traumatic force can be felt, which is the head acceleration. I told you about this, the motion. Uh, it could be the blast, which gives us the overpressure. Uh, it could be non-conventional forces. You know, uh, these days, uh, you know, our, our enemies become very uh, innovative. Many other ways, you know, uh, it can be a uh, uh, traumatic force can be felt. So for many different, you know, uh, uh, conditions, we need to look at the every aspects of the brain tissue at the cellular level, because that is what we are focusing, uh, which includes uh, the glial cells, the neuron cells, the, the extracellular matrices, and all we have to identify first all the different components of the brain tissue and what will lead them to damage. And once we take into account all these factors, then we'll be able to assess whether and, and a given input uh, brain trauma would lead to injury or not. I think that will uh, uh, make it a very uh, uh, comprehensive ass assessment, right? So first I'm going to talk about what are the factors can lead to mechanical injury. Okay, and the next part, Dr. Gilpin will talk about what kind of factors can lead to uh, a pathway level injury or the secondary injury. Okay. So, we are talking about the injury from the cellular level, which means we are going to look at the uh, brain tissue at the very, very highly magnified scale at, at the level of a single you know, neuron. So, this image uh, is, is a very nice image. I, I, of course, I obtained from the uh, uh, from online from a publication, but it gives us a very good picture of the neural cell. If you look at one neuron cell, it is very long, fiber-like, rope-like structure. But if you if you look at inside the neuron cell, it also has many different fiber-like and and soft, you know, tissue-like uh, in the substance inside, right? So. A single neuron cell, if you want to assess what actually caused the neuron cell to damage, we have to look at their components, which is the subcellular structures, uh, if you want to do a very comprehensive brain injury analysis. So this is what we do. We look into, take into account all the major elements inside a single neuron and look at them one by one and find our, out their uh, force or I mean the stress, I mean the strain and the strain rate that can cause injury to these individual components. And we take into account a microtubule, the neurofilaments, the microfilaments, and then micro microtubule associated protein tau or MAPT, each of them individually and their collection to find out what level of strain and strain rate would lead to their damage. So this is an example uh, the way we do the test is we take a, we build a molecular structure of the microtubule 
and then we apply a stretching force. As you can know that if I apply this force at eventually at some level of deformation, it will break just the way I show the cartoon uh, how the rope might break. And at the same time, we look at how fast and how slow we are applying this force because if I do it very slow, that will be a slow rate. If I do it very fast, it will be a very fast rate. So we want to assess this property at, at a slow rate and high rate and find out what percentage of stretch will lead to damage. And we note that down. And we do this for all other uh, you know, combinations. And this is one, one example of microtubule uh, uh, injury curve. Remember, we are, we are only taking into account one part of the neuron, right? A very tiny substance. And definitely tells us that uh, there are a combination of a strain and a strain rate can cause injury or not. And this uh, borderline between the pink region and the and the green region means we are trying to find out all the data points at different combinations so that we can get generate this comprehensive injury curve for microtubule. And we want to do the same for all other subcellular components, including uh, the tau protein, the microtubule and tau protein interfaces, neurofilaments, microfilaments, and get a similar injury curve and, 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 and find out what caused their injury. And the takeaway message from this study is each and every subcellular components, what we notice is very much dependent on the amount of stretch and the speed of the stretch. So both the strain and the strain rate play a very dominant role in the damage of this uh, uh, subcellular complex. So once we get all those data, what we do this now, remember, we, are, we, are, we started from the very bottom scale. We, we evaluated the mechanical property of each and every dominant cytoskeleton elements. Now we combine those data into a single neuron model, which is we did with a uh, finite element analysis. What it does is it takes into account all the different ways individual components of the neural cell can break, then collectively give us what would lead to the breakage of the damage of the neural cell. Again, for a given strain and strain rate input, we would be able to predict what would cause the uh, injury to this neural cell. So that way we can we can find out by taking a model from a realistic, very real, you know, image-based data of the neural cell, we can be able to predict what will lead to injury to this neural cell, okay? All right, so now, uh, as we do this research, of course, this is definitely not a one group's work. It's a very complicated, very, I think, large problem. So what benefits us very, very, I think, tremendously is our collaboration with this team uh, uh, called Panther. So this is a hub that actually studies traumatic brain injury from all different aspects, okay? And it is a DOD funded project. The, the lead institution is University of Wisconsin Madison, and it involves academia, industry, and national labs. And these are, you know, the current PIs for this uh, a, a Panther group. I'm very, I think, uh, fortunate to be engaged with this uh, team because every uh, uh, team members has their own capabilities and contributions to give us a very comprehensive understanding of brain injury, okay? So what we have done so far, so this is kind of uh, a, a overall uh, findings so far from the Panther group, including our contribution about the injury risk of the brain due to, uh, I mean, the neural cells due to mechanical trauma, okay? So you can see that uh, we began with just a, a horizontal line, I mean the diagonal lines separating the no injury, the pathway and the mechanical injury. Now, as we obtain more data, we become, I think, uh, more predictive on the shape of this injury curve, right? Again, the, the idea is, as we can get more data points at every location, we'll be able to uh, even evolve this shape of this injury curve even further, but the idea is the same what combination of strain and strain rate would lead to uh, uh, cellular injury, okay? And there are three possibilities, no injury, the pathway injury, and the mechanical injury. So, so far, I showed you our progress so far on predicting the mechanical injury. 
now I will I'll let Dr. Gilpin continue and, and talk about, in a way, what we have done so far in pathway injury to the new ones. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Adnan. Um, the first thing that we need to talk about when we're talking about electrochemical injury is on the next slide, we're gonna go into a brief overview of brain waves. So what are brain waves? Well, the cool thing about neurons is that they are electrically excitable cells. And so uh, because they have ions, flying across synapses, we can record the signals that that current produces. And there are four basic brain waves. The first one is beta, um, and this, if you were to account for 24 hours of brain waves, beta would be the most common. And this would be what I would expect to record from you while you are listening to this, this, uh, this brown bag lunch. Um, where you are actively engaged at the task at hand and your mind is you know, completely engaged. There is, of course, an op uh, one option that I might record alpha waves from you, which would mean that you are a little zoned out, perhaps your eyes have glazed over, you're not really paying attention, you're daydreaming. Um, and so uh, that you know, accounts for a significant portion of everybody's brain waves every day. Theta is the least common brainwave, and um, this occurs between when you're awake and falling asleep or when you're asleep and starting to wake up. So you don't see that very often throughout the day. And then delta waves are the slowest brainwave, um, and uh, these occur when you're in a very deep sleep. And as a matter of fact, del the only difference between delta waves and uh, coma is that you can wake up from a delta wave sleep and coma has other factors at play and you can't easily wake up from a coma. So um, delta, that just gives you an idea of how deep a sleep you have to be in when delta waves occur. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, the very top line is the EEG recording. And um, I'm just I'm showing you this so that you can understand EEGs are a uh, composite of the underlying brain waves. Um, and so EEG is a very global measurement of brain activity. And on the next slide, I break it down a little bit more. So on the right hand side, that's the global level. This would be the EEG measurement of all of the brain activity. Um, but we could also do it a little bit more on a regional level. You can you can measure brain activity based on region. Uh, but then what we are going to spend, what we've been talking about really for this whole talk and we'll continue to talk about is the cellular level. What is happening at the level of the single neuron? What kind of action potentials are firing and how can we measure them? Um, and so we are going to talk about using, um, uh, well, we're going to talk about the most common one of the most common effects of TBI on the cellular level, which is axonal swelling. So on the next slide, you'll be able to see what we, the, what we call blebbing. This is the technical term for swelling uh, if it occurs inside a cell. And so I'm going to draw your attention to the left side of the screen where it says figure C. This is where I think you can best see the, the blebbing or the swelling, although you can certainly see it in all of the images. And you'll see that the staining for the axon, instead of being uh, evenly spread throughout the length of the axon, it's accumulated in certain spots. So the staining is more dense in certain spots and it's not spread out evenly across the entire length of the axon. This is indicative of swelling, of focal axonal swelling, um, and uh, can be one of the biggest problems uh, for, for uh, patients with traumatic brain injury. And so this led us to ask the question, does this swelling in some way negatively impact action potential propagation? So on the next slide, you'll see um, uh, a quick schematic of what Dr. Adnan's group is able to uh, predict or what they're able to um, do from a, a computer model. And you'll have the healthy axon at the top and then the swelled axon in the bottom. But I'm going to get into more detail on the next slide, actually. Um, and so here we have the same neuron that you saw a little while ago. But in this case, we have included the 
swollen region with zone alpha and zone bravo, which just equate to the section of the axon immediately upstream of the swollen region. That's zone alpha and then immediately downstream of the swollen region. That's zone bravo. Um, and you'll see these referenced in the next few slides, so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then I'd also like to point out in the center of this slide, you'll see the multicolored uh, 3D model of the axon. And th it's important to know that this is just the top half of the axon. So if you can imagine this same image inverted and placed right next to each other where you would have a whole circle, that's uh, the computer model. And we're just showing you the top half of the axon. So on the next slide, um, we're going to start a series of, of two cases that I'm going to show you. This one is a swelling ratio of 19. That is to say that the swollen, the, I'm sorry, the radius of the swollen region of the axon is 19 times larger than the radius of the remaining sections of the axon. So the swelling ratio is 19, and the little video in the bottom right hand side where you saw the action potential propagate from zone alpha to zone bravo indicates that there is no problem with action potential, action potential propagation. The swelling ratio of 19, that swollen region of the axon, does not interfere and certainly does not block the action potential uh, propagation, the ability for that action potential to pass from zone A to zone B. The next slide, though, will show you a little bit of a different scenario. This time, the swelling ratio is 28, which means the radius of the swollen region of the axon is 28 times larger than the radius of the remaining sections of the axon. And here, uh, once we play this video, you'll see that the action potential does not propagate. So you'll see it move along nicely in zone alpha, Again, that's upstream of the swollen region, and it is blocked. It does not pass over that swollen region, and it never gets to the downstream region, zone bravo. And so uh, we, uh, this it, you know, indicates to us that different levels of swelling can affect the action potential propagation in different ways. And so the next question we asked was, can we predict the way that swelling could either block or allow the action potential to pass. And that's what's shown in this slide. So on the y-axis, we have the, the radius of the swelling, the, the swollen section of the axon. And on the x-axis, we have the radius of the, ax the rest of the axon segments. And you'll see that we are able to predict which action potentials will be blocked, that's in the red zone, and then which action potentials will be allowed to pass and, and the propagation can continue. Um, and this is very exciting to us because perhaps future research, we could in some way manipulate that swelling to either allow the action potential to pass um, or, or, or not. And, uh, you know, preferably we would allow that action potential to pass, which would perhaps alleviate some of the symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury. Um, so it's pretty exciting research uh, and uh, we will see what's to come. But in the next slide, um, I'm going to go over what's next, right? What's the path forward? So we really think that EEG can be a method of identifying the signal anomalies from the blocked action potentials. I mentioned earlier that brain waves are, are measured by EEGs and brain waves are simply electrochemical signals. And so if we can detect those signal anomalies using EEG, we could have a way where we could link the mechanics to the biology. And so once a brain is exposed to traumatic brain injury, which I'm showing here on the top left of the slide, um, showing the uh, anthropomorphic heads being exposed to a blast. Of course, this is meant to simulate IEDs, but the heads are exposed to that blast wave overpressure. Then what happens most frequently is cell swelling. And sometimes that cell swelling uh, is, is not able to be recovered, right? And then the cell will die. And when I was doing my postdoc research at NRL, we did some research on caspase-3, which is a protein 
marker for cell death. And we did see that, in fact, cell death was increased in cell cultures that were exposed to the the blast wave overpressure as compared with control cell cultures that were not exposed. But sometimes the swelling is able to resolve itself. Um, but once the swelling has occurred, we've just shown you data that sometimes that indicate that the swelling can sometimes cause the action potential not to propagate. Um, and so we could hopefully uh, take those uh, signal anomalies and record them on an EEG. And then in this way, we'll be able to link the mechanics of the of the very physical properties that occur during the cause of the traumatic brain injury to the biological properties of the outcome of the traumatic brain injury. Um, so we are quite excited <laughs> about this. Um, and then in summary, what we have shown you today is that focal swelling, uh, and this refers to the axons, focal axonal swelling attenuates action potentials. That's a fancy biological way to say that action potentials do not pass through the swollen region of the axon. Uh, we've also shown you that tau and microtubules, um, that, or that the binding of tau and, and, and microtubules um, is quite strong and that it requires tau to stretch to 11 times its normal length before tau will disassociate from that microtubule. And if you think that's strong, then it's even more impressive that the, the dimerized tau protein, tau tau, is even stronger than the tau microtubule uh, binding. And so um, these taken together uh, make us really excited about our future work. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilfin. So I think uh, in summary, I think uh, nicely stated, uh, as I try to describe that we want to uh, uh, understand the brain injury uh, risk predictions from the cellular level and building all the way to the uh, macroscopic level, the brain tissue and the head level, right? So once we understand more deep that how we can predict brain injury, our next step definitely want to assess this. That means sense this you know, injury risk and then protect the head. So I think that two things that is coming uh, has to happen to uh, protect our head. And that's what I think we look forward to uh, doing. We just, you know, uh, received the two uh, uh, grant from the Office of Nephrology Research that will allow us to advance our understanding, I think, even further. And along these two aspects, first, now we want to uh, uh, also look at our understanding how we can sense the, the brain injury risk immediately after exposure to, uh, you know, uh, some kind of traumatic force. As uh, Dr. Gilpin mentioned, also we talked about in the earlier discussion, that the brain injury can actually happen two ways. One is immediate due to the mechanical injury, and another is a little bit subtle that happens to a pathway base. That means a secondary injury, and that can take actually days, hours, and you know, even even longer time. So that is very subtle. So uh, you know, detecting uh, brain injury risk as soon as possible would really be uh, you know leading to a lot of breakthrough and also save lives because of this, you know, uh, the, the uh, way the brain actually really can happen. And then once we understand this, we also want to uh, advance uh, our understanding how the protective equipments can be made so that we can protect the head against this kind of, you know, traumatic events. So I think, uh, you know, I must thank my group. As you can uh, tell, I, I only present this data, but they are the one, uh, the behind the scene workforce who help us get to this level and 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 of course uh, uh, we, we have uh, uh, we have a group of postdocs uh, then phd students uh, master's level students in undergrad level students all are at uta and and we also have uh, alumni uh, alumni uh, dr Yu and dr khan who contributed significantly to this project uh, who are now uh, uh, at the different institutions so uh, uh, I, as you can see that, you know, students at all uh, level of backgrounds and, and their uh, academic roles uh, contribute. We, we have a very, I would say, a, a kind of a family-like group. We, we help each other, you know, uh, contribute each other's work. And that's how we, we feel 
we are we are making some impact in this field. And of course, uh, uh, we must thank uh, our, our funding agency. I think without uh, financial support, this kind of research is, is almost impossible to carry forward. I'm very, you know, uh, uh, fortunate to receive uh, uh, several uh, uh, grants from the Office of Nepal Research, four research grants and two equipment grants that actually allows us to uh, advance this field uh, to the best uh, way possible. And of course, uh, the collaboration with the Panther team is, is another, uh, I think, uh, fortunate thing that happens to me, I would say, because that gives us a, a very strong collaboration with this team. And I think these are fascinating people out there from all across the US and collectively we are trying to uh, solve uh, this, this uh, very serious problem, right? And I, I of course, uh, I'm very also fortunate to work at the uh, US Naval Research Lab of NRL because that uh, kind of, you know, give me uh, the initial platform or uh, exposure to this field and then allow me to, uh, you know, uh, work forward to this field, okay? Uh, some names I must mention, uh, Dr. Timothy Bentley, uh, the Program Officer of Office of Naval Research, who uh, has been supporting our, our, our research for the last several years. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Christian Frank, uh, he is at University of Wisconsin, the Program Officer for this Panther program. And I'm, I'm also, uh, you know, getting benefit from him by, or, you know, uh, uh, working with his group and all the Panther team members. Uh, my uh, former student, Dr. Fahad Ferdos, he is now a faculty member at Indiana State, but he also uh, worked uh, closely with, with this effort. Uh, the Naval Research Lab collaborators, the Panther collaborators, and also we do uh, a lot of you know, high-level computations, uh, crunch numbers, so I must thank the Texas Advanced Computing, TACC, and the EXIT for uh, giving us hours for doing our computations. I think that's all. Well, I have to say, and thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilpin, for joining. And thank you, Dr. Das, for hosting this event. I'll be happy to uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abnin and Dr. Gilpin, for a very interesting talk. Uh, so to the audience, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, make sure that you put it in the appropriate window so that we can read it and, you know, uh, uh, and get the presenters to answer them. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I had a few questions of my own. Uh, so uh, obviously this is this is uh, work with a lot of different people. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Adnan, you showed a lot of people at UTA, your research group here, which is working on this. Uh, does Dr. Gilpin at uh, Parallax also have, uh, you know, a group of her own where she is, uh, you know, helping with some of this work? I'm, I'm just curious to know the composition. Of, of of the research team. No, I I just uh, am working by myself with okay. Dr. Right. Anand. Yeah, um, I was uh, like I said, you know, we were we met when I was a postdoc at NRL, and I was so excited to find somebody else who was interested in protein biochemistry because we were working together um, in uh, a um, very uh, mechanical engineering focused. Group, and so I came in there, and I was working with a biomedical engineer, but he also was was pretty heavily focused on mechanical engineering, and I was very happy to find Dr. Ednan, who was uh, pretty interested in in protein biochemistry, and so um, that's how we got started in our connection together, and then I moved to the Air Force Research Laboratory um, as a staff scientist, where we did some, where we wrote another paper together while I was at AFRL, and he of course was at UTA, and I've just recently joined Parallax Advanced Research, so um, it's a relatively new uh, move for me, but uh, that's how we got started. It was N NRL and then AFRL. Yeah, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to know more about your connections with, uh, uh, you know, with, with the UTA and Dr. Adnan. Um, uh, I'll go to some of the questions in the from the audience. I actually had one more question I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, when you're trying to do this kind of predictions, uh, uh, you know, so so there was an event so, so the, as an explosion or whatever, and you're trying to predict what kind of injuries has happened to the soldier. You know, to me, a data scientist, the first thing I think of when I think of predictive uh, problems is to think of a data-driven model. Uh, have you looked at data-driven technologies here, like you know, looking at past history of uh, 
you know, the kind of injuries people have uh, had in uh, actual scenarios and try to build uh, predictive models on that because I didn't hear any of that today. So it was a very, uh, you know, uh, clinical approach uh, towards your predictive, uh, you know, uh, scheme. So I was just curious to know whether anything like that has been done. Yeah, I can give maybe some perspective. Yeah, okay. Of course, I think uh, this brain injury research uh, has been going on for a while, and yeah. and it has been seen from many different perspectives. I think uh, from clinical perspective, from a data driven perspective for sure, and and also from this one kind of you know materials perspective or cellular level perspective. Right. I think I wish I have a few more hours. I can I can <laughs> go hours and after hours to give you an overview of what has been going on. And, and, uh, and I just wanted to focus on the cellular level because that is what I think we're contributing the most. But to answer your question, yes, there are there are research published uh, by taking at you know, data from human subjects. I think even for the uh, uh, military data, I think Dr. Gilpin can focus more, but uh, there is one particular company I know uh, based in uh, Washington DC National Harbor, they have uh, take into account uh, those uh, uh, military data and try to come up with a uh, kind of predictive uh, injury criteria. Okay, and so uh, so one I think challenge is 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 there. What I feel uh, and it is challenge to everybody that uh, there is no way one size fits all. You know, kind of uh, data driven uh, research is possible because. You know, even you look at the human subject, there is age difference, the gender difference, their, you know, uh, uh, their body attributes difference, so, so many factors. Okay. And and I think uh, it's it just very overwhelming. But in a, in a short uh, answer, uh, yes, there are research published taking into data, data at the macroscopic level uh, from the human subject. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to read out the, a question from the audience uh, from none other than our own uh, Dean, Peter Crouch. So he thanks you both for a wonderful exposition. And his question is, how is this work being viewed by the sports organizations, uh, both professional and uh, you know, university K-12 athletics? Are they significantly financially supporting this work at the national level? Oh, very, <laughs> very. Uh, very interesting question, uh, Dean Crouch, and thank you for listening. Uh, I'm not aware of any active you know, solicitations coming from uh, you know, the sports community, uh, I, it, it, but that could be my ignorance. I, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, as I see, the brain injury research is so complicated and there are many aspects are involved. Uh, and and I personally take you know interest on this uh, I think uh, you know, Navy related mission research because that's how I I think uh, receive the funding from I want to look at the aspect that you know I can start the Navy the first but uh, I know that you know, in particular through the Panther team as you can see that we have a team member which is coming from the bike one of the leading bike manufacturers. We have uh, a collaborator coming from uh, the, uh, the, the smart helmet, uh, not the smart helmet, the helmet, uh, military helmet and the bike helmet manufacturer. So I, uh, they take part and they have their own also source of funding that uh, you know, bring it in this subject. Uh, I think uh, you know, there are involvement from the uh, industry and the sports community, but I'm not really aware of any active uh, participation, but again, I, I just may not know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question from the audience, and this one from Saina Namazi Fard. I hope I got the name correct. Uh, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. How many electrodes do you usually use to collect the EEG signals in this case? Do you use the standard 10-10 distribution? Oh, it's a very technical question. <laughs> Thank you for asking this. I, I, I think, you know, the number of electrodes uh, it varies and, and we have not really did uh, uh, done any, any, I think, comprehensive study on the EEG. That kind of project we just started, I think, uh, hopefully by uh, next year, around this time, we should have more you know, data uh, to present. 
But as you know, uh, if you can buy EEG with many different combinations. There are 32 channel EEG all the way to 256 channel EEG. And uh, I think choice is yours. It involves more complexity. But the, I think uh, the, the physics remains the same. It, you, you connect uh, the EEG probe at a certain spatial distance, and, and then each of them has their own source localization technique to track down where the injury is coming from or is there any anomaly in the data. I think that's my understanding from my perspective. Dr. Gilpin might be able to give more neuroscientific you know, scientific, uh, <laughs> explanation. Uh, we, we did not really uh, pin down how many arrays is the, is the answer. I think uh, my understanding is the physics behind it is the most important. The number comes next. And I don't know if Dr. Gilpin, you want to add anything. Yeah, no, I mean, you have you have done a really great job uh, explaining that. I think you've hit the nail on the head. One of the the problems with EEGs is that the brain is so complicated and that things um, things happening in one part of the brain instantaneously affect things that happen in a different part of the brain. And there so it can um, it's it's really trial by error. You have to figure out what works right for your experimental setup uh, before before you uh, decide on what's going, what's going to be your standard procedure going forward. All right, thank you very much. Um, so um, I wanted to know a little bit more about the Panther project uh, at Wisconsin. So are they, I mean, what is their main sort of vision that they are working towards? Is this uh, traumatic brain injury their main objective or it's a part of their objective and you're helping them with that? No, no, no. So let me go to this slide that I showed. Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, you can search in Google and, and, and look a panther in Wisconsin Madison. It is a, a, a set aside program, I think funded by the DOD uh, okay. and, and from the US Congress. And each year they, they have some, I think, uh, uh, funding allocated for this program. You say I, I, I would call it a multidisciplinary hub focusing primarily uh, a brain injury. I think Panther has an acronym. I, I don't know. Yeah, so you can see that it's physics based neutralization of threats to human tissue and organ. So this is kind of uh, in, in a very unique way to define Panther, but it takes into account the brain injury and the comprehensive understanding of brain injury and try to predict it from, uh, you know, from all different length of scale and on many different scenarios. So it should start with brain injury, but as you see, the scope is very broad. Uh, once we understand brain, we want to move forward to other parts like the organs. Okay. Well, we are getting close to the end of the hour, so I will uh, uh, like to take this opportunity, unless there is any last minute questions from anybody, uh, I don't, see that. Uh, so I'll take this opportunity to thank Dr. Asfak Adnan and Dr. Kathleen Gilpin for a very, very fascinating and interesting lecture today. And uh, to everybody else uh, in the audience, uh, I hope you're enjoying these uh, brown bag sessions and we will have a lot more to come. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Das. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gilpin. And I must thank Tracy. She is working behind the scene to help us uh, go very smoothly. I appreciate you, Tracy. And, and thank you all for listening and, and also giving me the opportunity to talk today. I hope uh, we, we convey some uh, meaningful message. Thank you. Thank you.